On beginning, I would like to say that you and I, with this sermon, need to share an identification. There is a sense in which I will be proclaiming to you, but I proclaim to you as one of you. What do I mean by that? There are no great men of God. There are only tiny, little, needy men of a great and merciful God. That's all that has ever existed. There's only one hero in this story. I'm going to be talking to all, but I will be talking especially to men. And I want you to know that um, as we share a common Savior, we also at times share common sorrows. And mainly those sorrows uh, stare at us as we look in the mirror. Our own lack, our own inability, um, in so many areas, we have stumbled in so many areas. We fail. We are, do not act yet as we ought to act. And we're all in a great process. So as I begin to talk to you about the Word of God and its necessity, our necessity of the Word of God, I want you to understand that. That I'm speaking as one who is also needy. And then, let's go to a correction. The fact that I'm needy does not mean that I'm apathetic. I'm not saying there is a standard here in Scripture that, well, we can never progress toward, because that would be a lie. Um, I'm not going to be like the preacher I heard one time who came to the text that spoke on gluttony and then for about 15 minutes made fun of how he could never pass a McDonald's because he's basically setting up God's Word and saying not to take it seriously. What I'm going to say you need to take seriously, I need to take seriously, and there are men who do take it seriously. And so, the Bible wasn't written as a plan for us to fail. It is something that we can accomplish in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're talking particularly today about the Word of God. And you have a quote here from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 2. It says, what rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify him and enjoy him? And the answer in that catechism is the word of God, which is contained in scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. The word of God is absolutely essential to the Christian life. Now, here's my question for you. For men and women, even the young people who profess faith in Christ, tally up in your mind how many hours this last week you spent in reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating upon the Word of God. You see, there is a, a danger of being in a biblical church. There's a great danger of being in a biblical church. Um, just because you're in a church that is trying to submit itself entirely to Scripture doesn't mean that you are. Do you see that? It is not just being in a biblical church, it's becoming a biblical person. Now, that happens in great part by being in a biblical church. But the fact that you are in a church which seeks to submit itself to the sufficiency of Scripture it, it doesn't give you any accolade on the Day of Judgment. As a matter of fact, it increases your responsibility. Do you see? So the question is, as individuals, are we taking Scripture seriously? And here's something I have found out, actually, in experience. It is easier to have your life put in jeopardy for the preaching of the Gospel to do something extraordinary like that, it is easier than simply being obedient in the simple things of Christianity every day. I have no doubt that there are men and women here that if they were told to deny the Bible or die, they would die. But I want to tell you, in those moments, there's a special grace given so that you can overcome. I found it quite easy to have a gun put to your head. What's difficult is the daily routine, the being faithful day in and day out in the things that are considered simple. So, 
looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want us to expand it a bit and, and go to 12, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let me ask you a question. Have you been persecuted? Now, that doesn't mean martyred, because obviously you're here. It doesn't mean that people have beat you or chased you around with whips or thrown you at a lion. Has anyone ever mocked you? Has anyone ever called you holier than that? Has anyone ever got mad at you because you turned away when they were telling a filthy joke? If not, you're not godly. You say, how dare you? I, I'm sorry, I didn't write this. It says all. The word all in the Greek means all. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted at some time or another. Now, we do take it as a, as a proven fact that some Christians are persecuted just because they're obnoxious. That's not what I'm talking about. But, but actually, someone has taken a horse rasp or even a nail file to you because of your faith, because of your stand in righteousness. Because if this radically depraved, morally corrupt sewer of a world never has a problem with you, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Now, verse 13, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is Paul's description as an ongoing apostasy. It's an ongoing reality. There are times in history where this gets ramped up quite a bit. And I believe toward the end times it will be ramped up very high. But know this, this is, this is kind of the common fodder. This is the way things really are in this world. Evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. Deceiving and being deceived. So we live in a world that will persecute godly people. We live in a world where there is evil and evil men. There are imposters. They're not getting better. The world is not getting better. It's going from bad to worse. And they not only deceive, but they themselves are deceived. That's the kind of world we live in. If you are not set apart from that world in any way, if this kind of world doesn't see you as unusual, there's a real problem. This kind of world doesn't have a problem with you. Either you're not what you profess to be or you're being too quiet about it. But I have discovered that if a godly man doesn't even open his mouth, but walks in godliness, he will be persecuted. His relatives may call him a religious fanatic. His friends may turn away because he's no fun anymore. The people at the job will be angry because when they revel in a filthy joke, he walks away. I mean, is any of this look like you? Now, verse 14, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing of whom you have learned them. Now, I want you to look at something. Who was Timothy's teacher? The Apostle Paul. You can hardly do better than that. It was the Apostle Paul was his teacher. Now, he learned from him. I mean, you talk about, I don't want Paul to be mad at me when I meet him in heaven, but you talk about direct from the horse's mouth. He learned directly from the Apostle Paul. And he became convinced of it. He really did, because that's what it says. Timothy, Paul could see that Timothy became convinced of what he learned. He was totally convinced. But then this is what's unusual. He says, continue in these things. Continue in the things you have learned. We go to 1 Timothy. We see a lot of the same. Continue, continue. We also have examples of men who did not continue who they got um, extraordinarily diverted into things. 
You know, this is continue. This is the hard thing. Beginning is easy. Beginning is always easy. It's continue, continue, continue. But this is where the idea of a faithful man, a faithful woman, a trustworthy man, a trustworthy woman, they just continue, they continue. I often say that around here at Heart Cry, I say we, we have no racehorses. We want no racehorses. We want plow horses. We want mules. And boy, did we get them. All of us men that work at Heart Cry is a ragged, tagged bunch of men, either farmers or ranchers or military guys. And all of us have PhDs, of course, as a brother said earlier. We got them at Lowe's. We all have postal diggers. <laughs> But they just, they just go, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. And that's what, that's what he's telling Timothy to do because it's the hard thing to do. I have said there are men that two years ago I would have filled the platform with who now I will not. I do not believe they continued on. They got diverted. They got diverted. Now, l let me just show you something at the risk of, I don't want to depart, too much, but I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 for a second. In verse 1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. We don't have Paul using this terminology in other places. The Spirit explicitly says. And then he goes on. It's, it, it just, doesn't it, when you read this, just seem apocalyptic? Now we know that the latter times began with the death and resurrection of Christ. We know that. But doesn't this language just seem like, certainly in verse 3, he's going to talk about the coming of the Antichrist or something? I mean, doesn't it seem like that to you? And then we get to verse 3 and he goes, Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. Hold it. That really, verse 3, doesn't seem to really go with verses 1 and 2, does it? You would expect he would be talking maybe in 3 about witchcraft and gross immoralities. And he's just talking about this. Now, I will tell you that among scholars, there's a kind of a divergence of what Paul is talking about. You know, what, it could be this, it could be that. But I think if you wanted to take an overarching principle, it's this. And it is frightening. It's terrifying. Any time in the church of Jesus Christ you give anything preeminence over the person of Christ, and his redemptive work in the gospel, you have committed gross apostasy. Anytime you deviate. Now, I've, uh, I homeschool, so I don't want anyone to be angry with me about what I'm going to say, and there are many fine homeschoolers, far, far better than me. But I have seen this even among homeschoolers. You ask them, when were you converted? Well, I discovered homeschooling five years ago. That's not what I meant. Uh, I'm politically conservative, but is that your speech? Is that what you talk about all the time? I mean, what, what have you substituted? Anytime you set Jesus Christ and his gospel with a, in a conjunctive relationship with anything else saying it's equal, it will soon rise above. It was blasphemous to put it at equal, but it will always not stay there. It will go above. And so men who've departed from the simplicity of the gospel. How is the world to be healed? There's only one way. It's a cross. Where the Son of God died and rose again from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God and will reconcile all things in himself. That's it. That's it. And any time, and it's happened, oh, don't think that what's happened in the last two years is unusual. No, this is the constant bombardment, constantly 
put anything beside the gospel and over the gospel. It can be legalism, can't it? It can be all kinds of things. But no, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. So, he says, you continue. Now, I want you to get into verse 15. And we're going to compare it with verse 17. And, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. In verse 17. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Do you see that we have kind of an alpha and omega here? Scripture from the cradle to the grave. How is a child converted? Through the scripture. And in this case, he's talking about Old Testament scripture that pointed him to the Messiah. And if, if I could, uh, I've worked for many, many years on looking at Old Testament and rabbinic ideas with regard to Messiah. And what you need to understand is so many things that Paul says about Messiah was common among rabbis. Let me give you a statement. Everything that exists was made for Messiah. Everything for Messiah. You see, prior to the 2,000 years now we have of a reaction against Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah, if you go back beyond that in rabbinic literature, Talmud, other things, you will see that they were saying many of the things that Paul said happened in Jesus. They just couldn't agree with the fact that it happened in Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he's absolutely everything. All the Old Testament points to him. It all points to him. It's all looking at him. Can you imagine that day? I mean, here's this Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That doesn't mean he was sinful or his body was corrupt, but they did it. he didn't come in a pre-fall Adamic body like, they, like he appears in the movies, where he's a head taller than everyone else and he's just the most handsome guy. That's not the way it happened at all. He was, he was run of the mill. I mean, he was, he was common. Can you imagine this carpenter stands in front of all the religious leaders of the day and said, that book that you would die for, that book that you study 10 hours a day, that book you've memorized, that book that represents everything our nation is about, every bit of it was written about me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And that's what he said. You search the scriptures, but all of it was written about me. Isn't that amazing? That's why I love to appreciate the statement by Lorraine Butner in which he says, Jesus is the only expected person. There's never been anyone in history. Never. Julius Caesar wasn't expected. He wasn't. Churchill wasn't expected. No one. But the whole book is expecting one person. And it was fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. And to depart from that is ridiculous. Also, to have Sunday school for children that primarily paints pictures of Noah's Ark is ridiculous. And if that makes you mad, then repent and follow me on this. <laughs> Do you know why Noah's Ark is important? Oh, because all the animals got saved. No, because it's a type of Christ. Everything's important because it points to Him. Everything. That's why when men like Ken Ham and, and others are fighting for 11, the first 11 chapters of the book of uh, Genesis, that it's literal. I know Ken Ham to some degree. He's, he's, he's not so much worried about an ark. But he knows something. If those chapters are given away, then Romans 5 is given away. And if Romans 5 is given away, then we have no salvation. Do you see? And so this book is about pointing everyone to Christ. But here's the amazing thing. You say, yes. Well, before I go on, let me say this. Uh, when my children are, they start reading at about five. And I start them a lot earlier on what I call these Bible rhyme books. 
in which it's just a little book where the, you know, it rhymes. Children love rhymes. And I read it in all kinds of amazing voices. And um, after we go through one, then twice, then we go up a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complicated. And about the time of at the end of their five years, they're participating with the New American Standard. Now, it will be something like this. You look at your six-year-old and say, okay, read verse Romans 1.1. They read it. They may need help from an older child and then do the commentary on it. Okay, you read the next verse. What I'm trying to tell you is the Scriptures for your children. Don't keep the Scriptures from your children. And don't just give them little stories that have nothing to do with Jesus. Because all the stories have something to do with Jesus. Teach them the story of redemption every time you open your mouth and give them the Scriptures. That's what catechisms are about. And this is not just Westminster and Presbyterian. As beautiful as it is. But there's the 1689 London Baptist Confession and there's Keech's Catechism. That's the way children were taught. Learn theology, learn doctrine, learn those verses. The prove it to me catechism. Why did God made you? He made me for his own glory. Prove it. Give your children the scriptures. And then he goes on and it gets to 17 so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So here the scriptures are adequate to bring a child to Christ. And the scriptures are adequate to train a man to be the most mature and capable expositor of the scriptures on the planet. It's the same scriptures. It's the same scriptures. When I was a young man, um, I decided that I would give my life to a study of one thing. That I would study the whole Bible, but there would be one thing that I would concentrate on with every moment I could. I would take every verse in the Bible that has to do with the gospel. I would study every text. I would do the Greek work, the Hebrew work, whatever was required. And then I would start in the second century and I would work my way through to Martin Lloyd-Jones. And find out what has everyone said on this of the most beautiful things possible. And I would put it together. And it has been almost three decades. And it has been sometimes ten hours a day. And I can tell you this. That if you gave me 85 years and the greatest library in the world. And only gave me John 3.16. I would not even scratch the surface of that verse. That's how profound it is. It's like I just almost, if I was dead, I would turn over in my grave. When I hear people say, why is he preaching on the gospel? I know that. You will be in eternity, in etern- you will be in a, a thousand eternities in heaven. And at the end of that, you will not even have reached the foothills of understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how profound it is. And so here we have children can be saved. They can, but it must be with great caution and always involve the elders. Unless they're silly elders and don't involve them. Which is, makes up a great many elders in the world today. <laughs> but you can trust your elders. I like them. Who care about a soul. Who handle a soul fearfully. But, but a child can come to know Christ through the scriptures. It just has to be handled cautiously and carefully. But then, if you want to train a man to be the greatest missionary or the greatest preacher, it's the very same book. Isn't that amazing? That in itself shows you the power of this book. Now, I want us to go for a moment and I want us to go to Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look at verse 29. Here is the cry of God's heart, if we can use a 
if we can talk anthropomorphically. And I'm sure, I'm positive, was the cry of Moses. And I'm sure it's the cry of your elders here at this church. Looking at the people of God and saying this, Oh, when you have been an elder and a preacher for many, many decades, you can almost feel the pain of that, Oh, it, 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 the, the exclamation in itself almost just wears you out. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. I have two sons. One of them is here, and I'm very proud of them. I love them. They're a great help to me. But throughout their life, when I would see them maybe do something frivolous or kind of, in some things you just have to divert yourself on. There's nothing wrong with resting, playing, having a good time. But when you see them kind of go down a road in which maybe they're wasting time or they're not in Scripture enough or they're this, and you just sit down with them and you say, Oh, son, if you only could realize how much time you're wasting and how you're going to regret this later and how you should give yourself to this, things that are productive. Or, oh, son, this relationship, friendship, you need to be careful with it. It's dangerous. Oh, son, if you could only see through the eyes of your old father, Many of you have been in that place, both fathers and mothers. And why are you doing it? Well, it's here, right? That it may be well with them and with their sons forever. You want so much for them. And hopefully, when I'm saying this, you're not thinking about, yes, I want my son to be a professional. I want him to be a doctor. I want him to be a football player. I want my daughter to be this or that. Hopefully, you're not that trite. Hopefully, you're thinking, I want my son to be godly. I want my daughter to be godly. I want them to know the joy and the prosperity of a sense of God's pleasure. And this is a passion, and this is a passion for every true elder. But look how it unfolds. If only they had such a heart. Now, this is one thing that if you're genuinely a Christian, and not everyone in the church is a Christian, what I mean in the visible what you're looking at right now, in the true church, everyone is a Christian. There's no remnant theology if you're if you're really in the church, you're really a Christian. But in a local congregation, not everyone is Christian. But those who are, those who are, you don't really have to pray, oh, if they only had a heart. Because according to the new covenant, especially in Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32, they do have a new heart. Ezekiel 36, they do have a new heart. They have a heart. They've been changed. It's what born again means. It's the doctrine of regeneration, which God does away with that old Adamic fallen nature, puts in its place a new heart, a new heart that loves righteousness. And so that's covered. But you do need to be admonished if you're a Christian, what? To keep all God's commands always, to fear him. Throughout the, the Old Testament, there is a direct correlation between the fear of the Lord and God's word. Always. There's a direct correlation between faith and the word of God. Without the word of God, faith cannot exist. The Kantian idea that faith is a leap in the dark is absolutely absurd. It's not. It's a leap into the light. Even that is trite. The faith cannot exist apart from the word of God. Why do you believe something? You believe something because God has said it. And if God hasn't said it, you can't believe it. And if you do believe it, you're in presumption. Do you understand that? Let me give an example of how essential your faith is to the Word of God. Um, just, just go for a moment. I'm going to break another rule of preaching. Uh, just go for a moment to the book of Hebrews. Let me show you something. Verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Do you know what I hope for? To fly. I mean, without an airplane. I really hope to fly. 
I really do. I would like to. I hope to fly. Well, the Bible says, according to what's written here, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So I hope to fly, and you know what? I'm assured I can fly. I'm convinced of it. So I climb to the top of this church and I jump off. I mean regular, just Peter Pan, right off the pinnacle. What's going to happen? I'm going to die. But it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I hoped to fly and I was convinced I could, but I didn't fly. Okay, well let's try the next one. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. I've never seen a man fly. Unaided, I've never seen a man fly, but I am literally, I have the conviction that he can. And I have, more importantly, the conviction I can. I'm doing exactly what this text says. Do you realize it? So I go up again to the pinnacle of the church and I jump off and uh, that's it. That's all. You call my wife. But I did exactly what this says. Do you realize that? I mean, I did. I had assurance of something I hoped for. I was assured I could fly and that's all I've ever hoped to do was fly. Well, and I had the conviction I've never seen anybody fly, but I had such a strong conviction that I went ahead and stepped out on faith. And I jumped. I'm doing everything this text says. There's only one problem. I've taken it out of context. In what way? How can I have assurance of what I hope for? How can I have the conviction that something I've never seen exists only if God says it? If God says it, and I do not react to it positively, that's unbelief. If God hasn't said it, and I believe it, that's presumption. And both of them are deadly. Do you see how much you need the Word of God? So I'll walk by faith. I go, okay, write me out a list of ten promises in the Word of God. Well, well what? Because there is no faith apart from a promise. Apart from revelation. Well, I had a dream. Sorry, that's not good enough. I had a dream that I could eat pizza without my cholesterol going up. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. And so you see, the, the, the Word of God is central to reverence. It's central to faith. Do you know what else it's central to? Love. You say, how is that? I preached probably a different sermon earlier this morning, so you can go back and do that one. But let me, let me just share with you something. How many of you lament the fact that you do not love God as you ought to? All of us are there, right? So what are we going to do? Well, let's go to some Acquire the Fire conference. Where they got, I mean, praise music going and the preacher, I mean, he's cleared off a spot and is pitching a fit and everybody's all wound up like a clock. Let's do that. You've already done that, haven't you? <laughs> and what happened? Lasted about two or three days. You wound down like a little wind-up toy, didn't you? And you were right back to where you started. Why? Because all that stuff's nonsense, that's why. Well, then what do you do? How do you make yourself love God more? You can't. Well, then we're doomed. No, we're not doomed. It's just we're not going to put our hope in you. Let me give you an example. I, when I married my wife, whoa, you should have seen her in all her glory. She is something. We've been married for a long, long time. We've both changed. We've changed. I've really changed. I love her more now. She's not 20. I love her more now. Why? Now, when someone says that, what happens? Immediately, every oh, what a great man. You know, you see some man who loves 
his wife. And what do you think about? You think about the man. Oh, he's such a wonderful man. He loves his wife. Maybe he's not a wonderful man at all. Maybe he has a wonderful wife. My point is this. Why do I love my wife more now than I did before? Because I have seen over the decades more of her virtue. More of who she is. And it's her virtue, a greater revelation of her virtue that does something to me, draws out my affections. Do you see that? So if you want to love God more, what do you do? You go look for more of God. And if your if your heart is unregenerate, and you're lost and just a church member. The more you see of God, the more you'll hate him. Guarantee it. But if your heart has been changed, you're regenerate, you're a Christian. The more you see of God, his beauty, his splendor, his faithfulness, his power, his love, the more you see of it, the more he will draw that beauty of God will draw out your affections. Will draw out your affections. Some of you probably go on vacations or something and maybe you went on a vacation and you found a place. The sunsets or the sunrise or sunset over the ocean or the mountains was absolutely splendid. The sand was white or the pines were beautiful. And you just keep going back and back and back. And you say, oh my, I'm so glad I discovered that place. It's just a joy to us. And look what, prior to discovering that place, you didn't love it. You had no affection for it. Now it draws you back constantly because you saw it. Do you know why there are some people who are able to die the most horrific deaths in the name of Christ? Do you know why there are people who are able to apart, depart from their family and not return for 40 years serving in the worst hell hole on the planet? Do you know why? It's not that they're better from, than you. We all come from the same stock of Adam. Then what is it? They've just seen more of Christ than you have. Paul says it is the love of Christ that constrains us. And we're so humanistic. We always think it's Paul's love for Christ that pushed him on and constrained him. That's not what he's saying. He's saying Christ's love for me pushes me on. Do you see the difference? So you see someone who seems to have an extraordinary love for God and automatically, and you do this, you're guilty. Automatically you'll go, man, that guy, that, that woman, they're special. See how humanistic we are? It has nothing to do with them. Because if you see someone loving God, it's just because their affections have been drawn out. Uh, let me just quickly give you a proof of it. Look, look at 1 Thessalonians. You say, Brother Paul, where did you learn to preach? And I say, well, I never really did. Um, but what I would do, here's how I learned to preach. When I went to Peru, I would travel one or two days, the back of trucks, mules, everything, go up in a mountain. There'd be anywhere from 100 to 400 men standing there. And this was the conference. Okay, first question. Second question, third question, you stand out there for four hours and then eat something, come back again for four hours. So that's how I learned how to preach. That's why it's such a mess. Um, look at verse 9 of chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you. These are pagans. And how you turned to God from idols to serve God. A living and true God. Now, Greek scholars will tell us that this order is very important. Notice that it doesn't say that they turned from idols first to God, but they turned to God from idols. So the point he's making is not that these are these idol worshipers and they finally they look at their idols and they look at their lifestyle and they get tired of it. And so tired of their idols and their lifestyle they go looking and they find God. That's not it at all. That's not what's going on here. And Hebert, who's one of the best Greek guys I know, he backs me up on this. 
matter of fact, I learned it from him. Um, here's what happens. They're totally content with their idols. Now you're thinking, I'm thinking, you know, some grotesque statue, which it could have been, but let's make this real. Golf courses and football and mansions and cars that cause you to get in tremendous amount of debt. All those types of things. I want to make this real for you. Well, they're content with their idols and they're content with the lifestyle those idols bring. They were content. And they would have remained content forever. Because like gives to like. But here's what happened. All of a sudden, Paul comes and starts preaching Christ. And it's when they saw through the Holy Spirit and regeneration, illumination. It was only when they saw Christ that they became discontent with their idols. Do you see the difference? There is a tremendous difference. So it wasn't self-generated. It wasn't like this philosophical, I'm looking at idols, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at my lifestyle, I hate it, I want to find something else. No, it has nothing to do with any goodness in a human being. It has nothing to do with any of that. It all began with Christ. Christ appeared in that light, they saw darkness. Christ appeared and they saw beauty and in that beauty they saw filth. So that's what it, but that's not just for conversion, my brothers and sisters. Do you know that the job of, of the elder, he's a miner who mines, Job 28. He goes into places no one else goes. He stays there a long time. He swings precariously over text trying to figure out what's there. It's not what Job 28 is talking about, but it's a wonderful illustration. It talks about those people who go into these mines to look for gems when wisdom is what truly ought to be sought after. But in a sense, the elder goes into his study. And you know the only thing he's really trying to do? He's not there for himself even. He's there for the bride of Christ. And he's there looking for, oh, that's beautiful about Christ. Oh, and that one is beautiful about Christ. I can't wait to present this on Sunday. This, this beautiful man. They've never seen this before. And then he says, behold your God. And then they go, we've never seen him like that before. How is it that we haven't loved him more? Do you see? That's what it is. It's not your best life now. It's not even how to fix your marriage. It's showing them Christ. It's showing them Christ. You see. Now, back to 29 of chapter 5 um, of Deuteronomy. Um, so how do we grow in the fear of the Lord, reverence for Him? How do we grow in love? How do we grow in faith? There's one way, seeing more of Him, seeing more of Him, seeing more of Him. When COVID and all this started happening and it seemed like the world was falling apart, everybody needed an answer. Everybody needed an answer. Everyone needed to know what was God doing, what was God doing, what was God doing. That is idolatry and that's an attempt to hold God hostage when your attitude is that way and it demonstrates immaturity. Because basically you're, what you're saying is, I will not have peace, God, until you tell me what's going on. That's idolatry. The mature response of the Christian is, God, I don't need to know what's going on because I know who you are and I know you're sovereign and whatever you're doing is right, even if it leads to my death. It's not those who know what God's doing who will be strong in the book of Daniel. It's those who know their God who will be strong in the book of Daniel. You see. Now, to get down to some practical here, I'm just going to just go really, really quick. In chapter 6, we get to, you know, Shema, Hero Israel, verse 4. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then immediately following that, this is the greatest of all commandments, immediately following it, these words, 
which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. The proximity is powerful. Don't you see that? One of the ways, the way, the great way, that we're able to move towards attainment of what we see in verse 5. Well, I could also include verse 4. One of the ways that we can see the exclusivity of God, the uniqueness of God, and love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is through His revealed Word. Verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today. You say, but He's talking about laws. Here's what you need to understand. The laws are designed to do a few, many things. First of all, to show us our need of a Savior. They're also, once we have a Savior, there is wisdom in the law. When properly understood, there is great wisdom in the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature. There is great need of it, and it is good. Okay? But what you need to understand is that the law is a revelation of God also. Every work of God reveals something about the character of God. Every law of God reveals something about the character of God. And so, the way we're able to know Him and to love Him and to believe Him is only through His Word. Only through His Word, dear brothers and sisters. And this is the Word that needs to become practical. It needs, you need to do this. Look, look at what it says. Verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now don't, don't deceive yourself. It's very easy, I know. Believe me, I know how easy it is to be self-deceived. When I say these words shall be on your heart, you're going, yes, yes, yes. Okay, how often are these words on your heart? Let's say you're awake for 16 hours a day. Where are these words? Where are they? You know, people lament, you know, why are we losing our children and teenagers and our college students and everything? And do you really think it's a mystery? I mean, really? Eight hours a day, five days a week, at least in in my area, they're in schools where they are totally being bombarded with anti-Christian propaganda that goes against everything the Bible teaches. Okay? That's 40 hours a week. Afterwards, they come home and most of them get on the internet, at least a couple hours, and television. So let's let's just bump that up to, to 12 hours now a day and on weekends in which they're being bombarded with anti-Christian, ungodly information. And then they're surrounded in their schools by other children who are given to the same things. And then on Sunday, you have them paint a picture of Noah's Ark with crayons. Really? You think there's a mystery? Why, Why we're losing our children? Come on. I mean, think about it. It's not a mystery. How much time do they see their father studying the Word of God? How much time do they hear their father speak about the Word of God? How many times do they see their mother and father talking about the Word of God? Now, here's what I want you to see, brethren. I am one of you. I say this to myself. Please understand. I'm not sitting, standing here saying anything other than... It's almost like instead of looking at it as Paul Washer said this, almost look at it this way. I'm not standing forefront. I'm standing sideways. And I'm going like this. Brethren... (laughs) Did you just hear what he said to us? To all of us? Did I need to spend more time with my wife in the scriptures and prayer? 
Did you hear that? Because that's what I heard. Did you hear that? And I need to spend more time uh, with my children in the scriptures. That's what I heard. Did you hear that? And I need to exemplify the scriptures in a greater way, especially with her mother. Did you just hear that? Because that's what I heard. So this is us. This is me and you. And women, it's the same way. Yes, there are different roles in the family and there's different roles in the church. But you know what? Men and women grow the same way. Through an in-depth study of Scripture to know God. Women need the same doctrine, the same theology, the same everything to grow as men do. And I've known one of your elders for a longer time. I've met the other two. I believe that you're in a church where they're seeking. And here's what I say. I don't like to say biblical church as in perfection because all of us are semper reformanda. We're always reforming. We're always achieving a goal. We're always seeking, you know, God shows us something else in his word we didn't see before and we're making corrections. And but you're in a church that, yes, can be called biblical. Yes, but that doesn't make you biblical. Are you teaching your wife? Wife, are you teachable? Are you pouring into your children, both of you? Are you realizing that life is short and eternity is long? Are you also repenting? I can't tell you how many times I've had to go to my wife or my children and ask for forgiveness. Oh, and since I really don't know how to preach anyways, let me just make another rabbit run. Because I care about you, you need to know this. When you sin against your child, say the child is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, whatever, you're impatient, you're whatever you are. Don't try to fix that by just being nicer next time. That's not biblical. You go to your child and you say, I need to tell you something. I sinned against you. I was impatient. Name the sin. Please forgive me. And it's so, this is what's going to happen. So this has happened to me several times. So let's say your daughter's eight years old. and She's looking up at you. And what's she going to say? Oh, daddy, that's all right. That's where you really have to now go into teacher mode. And you say this, no, daughter, it wasn't right. It was sin. And I really need you to forgive me. I really need you to release me. And then to watch your little daughter, eight years old, put her hands like this, as close to your shoulders as she can get, and say, Dad, you sinned against me. You are impatient, but I forgive you and I love you. Wouldn't you do that if it was a brother? Wouldn't you want him not to say, oh, that's all right? Wouldn't you want him to say, yes, you sinned against me. I love you. I forgive you. Do do you see how we can say, oh, we're so biblical and really, no, we're not. The little things are the big things. Do you understand me? The little things are the big things. There really aren't many big things. I mean, you all may get the chance to die one day for the gospel, and that's absolutely wonderful. But the hard part is is living every day, especially. Like right now, it's so easy for me to appear godly. But with the people that are closest to me, That's the test. And so often I fail. And I have to say, forgive me. Do you see? That's what it means to be in a biblical church because you're the church. All right? Now you see why I got my worst grade in seminary in preaching. All right, well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. (laughs) 
Father, thank you for this day. Please bless your people. Bless your good people, Lord. Help them. In Jesus' name.